بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أحب الله continuing on with our series of sittings in Ramadan uh, we reached the third sitting that Imam bin Uthaymin rahmatullahi rahmatin wasiya mentioned he said my brothers indeed fasting Ramadan is a pillar of Islam Allah says, O oh, you who believe fasting has been prescribed for you, just as it was prescribed for the people before you, so that you may become pious. Fasting during a certain number of days, but whoever of you is ill or on a journey shall fast instead for the same number of days. And in such cases, it is incumbent upon those who can afford it to make sacrifice by feeding a needy person. And whoever does more good than he is bound to do because uh, does good unto himself thereby, for to fast is to do good unto yourselves, if you but knew. It was a month of Ramadan in which the Quran was bestowed or revealed from on high as a guidance unto mankind and a self-evident proof of that guidance. And as the standard by which to discern the true from the false, Hence, whoever of you lives to see this month shall fast throughout it. But he that is ill or on a journey shall fast instead for the same number of days. Allah wills that you shall have ease and does not will that you shall suffer hardship. But he desires that you complete the number of days required and that you extol Allah for his having guided you aright and that you render your thanks unto him. And in a hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, Islam is built on five things. Testimony that there is no God except Allah and that I am his messenger, wasallam. The performance of prayers, the compulsory charity, the performance of the pilgrimage to the house of Allah and fasting the month of Ramadan. And this is agreed upon in Bukhari and Muslim. And in Sahih Muslim, with fasting in the month of Ramadan before pilgrimage, meaning that the hadith mentions that fasting before pilgrimage in this hadith of Sahih Muslim, it is clearly mandatory in the religion of Islam. If someone denies that it's an obligation, then they have disbelieved and they should repent. If not, then they will die as a disbeliever who had apostated from Islam and they will not be washed or given the kefen or prayed upon in the janazah or have dua made for them to be given mercy or buried in a Muslim grave. Instead, they have to have a hole dug, dug for them far away from the Muslim cemetery so that they may not harm others with their bad smell or harm their families with their presence. So it means that the person who doesn't believe in the holy month of Ramadan that they believe that it's not an obligation, even if they claim the Shahada and they say that they're Muslim, if they say that they do not have to fast, they do not believe it's an obligation, they have disbelieved. And all those things apply to them. That means if they die, they don't die as a Muslim. If they're married to a Muslim, that their marriage will no longer be valid unless they repent. All the other ahkam, because they have left the fold of Islam. So it shows us the importance of knowing the pillars of Islam and knowing that Ramadan is from those pillars. Uh, Imam bin Uthaymin says Ramadan became obligatory in the second year of Hijrah. So the Prophet wasallam fasted for nine years and fasting went through two stages, two different stages. The first stage was that a person was given a choice between fasting and feeding a poor person with fasting being more preferred. So that means when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated fasting, fasting the holy month of Ramadan, initially it wasn't an obligation. Meaning it was legislated, but it was mustahab, it was recommended, it was preferred. But you had a choice. You could either fast or you could feed a, a, a poor person. Or you could feed, you know, feeding, uh, feeding a poor person for that day. So you had a choice. The second stage, meaning so the ahkam in Islam was ruled in stages. Islam came in stages. It wasn't like all of a sudden you had to pray five times a day. All of a sudden you had to fast a month of Ramadan. All of a sudden you have to do all these other pillars in the religion. No, 
everything came in stages. The Quran was revealed in stages, and fasting was in stages. The second stage was fasting without a choice, as is stated in Sahihain in Bukhari and Muslim, on the authority of Salma ibn al uh, Aqwa, I think, uh, that when the verse for those who can do it with hardship in, is a ransom, the feeding of one that is in, uh, who is poor was revealed, when this verse was revealed, that whoever didn't want to fast would feed a person. Until the following verse abrogated the original verse. So that means when an, another verse in the Quran was revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it, abrogate it abrogated or nullified the other verse. In this verse, that abrogated this, the first verse was, whoever of you lives to see this month shall fast throughout it. But he that is ill or on a journey shall fast instead for the same number of days. So Allah made it obligatory without giving a choice. The fasting is not obligatory until it is certain the beginning of the month has been reached and there is no fasting before the month begins meaning when you're very close to Ramadan as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said none of you should fast a day or two before Ramadan except for a man who custom who regularly fast he should fast that day and this is in Bukhari and the beginning of the month is determined in two ways there's two different ways the first way is by seeing the new moon, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever of you lives to see this month should fast it. And the saying of the Prophet وسلم, who said, if you see the new month, then fast. And this is in Bukhari and Muslim. So it is not a condition that everyone has to personally see the new moon. Just like we fasted, we didn't see the moon. But if someone trustworthy witnesses, then it is obligatory uh, on everyone to fast. So we relied on the uh, the people who are appointed to look for the moon here in Saudi Arabia and then the government made an official announcement that the moon was sighted and the next day would be fasting. So we rely on that because it was a trustworthy person and because the Muslim government uh, authenticated that and that became the duty for us to begin our fast. The witness must be mature. They must be a Muslim. They must be trustworthy. And they must have good vision. As for a young person or an insane person, then their witness is not to be taken. So for example, someone is mentally impaired. Okay? Or they're, they're not sane. And they see the full moon. We don't trust them as a witness for fast of the month of Ramadan. One of the conditions is that they have to be sane. They have to be sane. Another condition, as we mentioned, is they need to be Muslim. Um, and this is in accordance with the hadith of Ibn Abbas who said, Indeed, I have seen the new moon for the start of Ramadan. So the Prophet said, Do you bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except the law? He replied, Yes. Then he said, do you bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? Sallallahu alayhi wa He replied, yes. Then he said, O Bilal, tell the people to fast tomorrow. And this was narrated uh, in the five uh, sunnans except Ahmed. Of those not to be taken uh, as a witness include a person known as a liar, a hasty or impulsive person, a person with weak eyesight who is impossible uh, who, who cannot see uh, and has impaired vision. Uh, and this comes from the hadith of uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the people saw the new moon, so I told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he fasted and ordered the people to fast. This was in Abu Dawood and Al-Hakam. And in Sahih Muslim, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever sees it, it is obligatory on them to tell those in charge of the ummah. The start of fasting, Eid and Hajj are all done in the same procedure, meaning that you need a trustworthy person to see the to sight the moon. If someone is in a faraway place and they see the new moon, 
then they should fast and try their best to reach this news to those in charge of the Ummah. And if the news of the start of the month and end of it reaches someone before the government broadcast it, then it is obligatory to follow the news. It is an Islamically legal proof that should be acted upon as the Prophet والسلام, ordered Bilal to tell the people to fast as soon as he heard about the start of the month and he made it obligatory upon them to fast. If the start of the month is Islamically legal, then there is no need for a calculation of the moon because the Prophet وسلم, made a ruling according to seeing the moon, not by its calculation. He وسلم, said, when you see the new moon fast, and when you see the new moon stop the fast, uh, he وسلم, also said, if two Muslim witnesses see the new moon, then fast and stop the fast. And this was in Ahmed. So most of this lesson is about the uh, the sighting of the moon and about the beginning of the month of Ramadan. And since we've already started, we'll, we'll go into uh, the fourth sitting that the Imam mentioned. And these are from the rulings of praying in Ramadan. He said, my brothers, Allah has made many different types of acts of worship obligatory upon us so that we may take part from every type. So that we do not just fill up on only one act of worship and end up leaving that act. From these acts of worship, Allah has made some obligatory, which we are, which we are not uh, permissible to have deficiencies in, nor are we allowed to leave them. Meaning, if it's wajib, that we should do our best to do it perfectly, our prayer, our fasting, and it is not permissible for us to leave off fasting or praying without an Islamically legitimate excuse. For example, in the state of, for the Senate, in the case of women, and women. If they have their uh, their period of karamukum Allah, then of course it is not permissible for them to fast, nor is it permissible for them to pray. Likewise, if a woman has her postpartum bleeding, then uh, likewise it also takes the hukum of uh, height of uh, the period. So those are legitimate reasons why a person has for leaving off prayer. Uh, also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made some acts, uh, extra acts, for which we can attain good and seek to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From this, Allah has made the five daily prayers obligatory. So those are the acts of worship, of course, that are obligatory. They are five in action and 50 in the scale. So in your scale of good deeds, they will be counted as 50. Allah has made the nafil or the nawafil prayers as a way to perfect perfect the obligation to attain the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, two rakahs before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, two after it, two after Maghrib, and two after Isha. Then there is the night prayer which Allah talks about those who perform them in the Quran. Uh, by saying, those who spend the night in adoration of their Lord prostrate and standing. And by saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, who forsake their beds to cry unto their Lord in fear and hope and spend of what we bestowed upon them. No souls, no what is kept hid for them of joy as a reward for what they used to do. So it shows us the importance of praying extra prayers, your sunnah prayers as they say, and of course, fasting extra fast outside of Ramadan, and giving sadaqa. All of these things are extra deeds which will be rewarded from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala if you do, and they uh, gain. We can gain immense reward. And very important to know those sunnah prayers. As the Sheikh he mentioned, there's two before Fajr that you should never leave. Always pray your your two Fajr sunnahs aside from your Fajr prayer. Uh, there are four before Dhuhr. There are two after Dhuhr, and then there are two after Salat al-Maghrib, and there are two after Salat al-Isha. These are very important sunnahs that you should ne'er never leave. And there's a hadith, uh, the hadith of Umm Habiba, radiallahu ta'ala anha, in which he said uh, that the one who, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever prays uh, 
the Ihdasha Raka the or or Ithnaasha the twelve uh Rakat Buriya Lahu Bihinda Baitan Vil Jannah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make for them a house in paradise. So if you pray these sunnahs regularly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make for you a house in paradise. So that is very important and that gives us that should be the the targheeb, the uh, thing which should make us want to pray our sunnah prayers. Pray and do your extra acts of ibadah as much as possible. The Prophet والسلام, said, the best prayer after the obligatory ones is the prayer at night. Uh, he وسلم, said in Sahih Muslim, O people, spread salam, offer food generously, uphold the ties of kinship, stand in prayer at night when people are sleeping, and enter paradise in peace. And this is this was in Sahih uh, Tirmidhi and in Hakim. So this shows us the importance of spreading the salams. That that is uh, that's an obligatory duty upon us. But you, and you'll receive immense ajr for that, and it brings uh, love between the the believers. Also, uh, you know, be generous with your food. You know, in making dishes for your neighbors, uh, and sharing food with others. Uphold the ties of kinship. Keep the ties with your parents. Keep the ties with your grandparents. Keep the ties with all your family as much as possible. This is an important reminder for us all. Uh, and stand in the prayer in the night. From the night prayer is the wit witter. The least of it being just one raka and the most being 11 raka. And you make it odd by having just one raka by itself. As the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, Whoever wants to pray one, whoever wants to pray one raka for a witter, then they may. And this is in Abu Dawood and An Nisa'i. Or you may make witter with three rakats, make it combined. As the Prophet والسلام, said, whoever wants to pray three rakats for a witter, then they may. And this is in Abu Dawood and Nisa'i as well. If you wish, you may perform these rakats with just one salam, as narrated by uh, a Tahawi that Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to make witr three rakats without making taslim except at the end. So meaning one taslim, meaning that you say salamu alaykum, salamu alaykum, but you, you pray three rakats together. And in fact, the Imam, the day before he did this, he prayed his witr like that. He prayed uh, uh, three rakats, uh, after the second rakah, he got up, and then he uh, prayed the, the third rakah, and then he made his taslim. Uh, and so, and if you prefer to pray three with a taslim after the first two, as is related by Bukhari, that Abdullah bin Umar, radiallahu ta'ala, and used to make the taslim after the two rakah, or used to make after the first two rakah, then make taslim again after the third. So he used to make the the taslim after uh, two after the first two. Then he made taslim again after the third. Even so, that he would do something important between the two parts of the winter prayer. And it is possible to pray five rakat without sitting or making taslim except at the end. This is due to the statement of the Prophet and Ahi. Salatu wa salam. Whoever wants to make witr five, then he may. Uh, Abu Dawood and Nisa'i. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to pray 13 rakahs at night from those who would make the last five witr without sitting in them except at the end, mutafakun alayhi. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make seven rakahs witr and would perform them just like the five rakahs as stated by Um Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha. The Prophet والسلام, used to make seven rakahs with her as well as five. He would not have a salam or talk in between. Uh, and this is in Ahmed, Nisai, and Ibn Majah. So this shows us, and there's many other details the Shaykh mentions about the wither, and you can read it from the text, uh, which it talks more in detail about the wither. And one of the things which is very important uh, that we can gain from this is knowing that there are many different ways to practice the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That some of these affairs 
the Amr is wasi'ah, which means that the there is uh, many options according to the Sunnah. And that way, the more and you get, the more knowledge of these various ways, then you will not be harsh with people if they differ with you. So that's very important for us to know, and that's why we need to end, so that we know and we understand that there are different ways. The Sheikh also mentions about Tarawih. He says uh, that our pious predecessors used to make the prayer very long. Uh, Sa'ib Sa ibn Yazid radiallahu said the Imam used to recite with Ma'in so much so that we used to rely on using sticks from the length of standing that they were so the prayers were so long and they would pray the rakah so long that they would use sticks sometimes to stand in prayer and I remember the first time I ever saw anything like this was when I was in Yemen when I went to the Maj in the time of Shaykh Muqbil, Rahmatullahi, Rahmatullahi, Wasiyah. And they would pray so long because they would probably pray the Sunnah. You know, they would pray the Sunnahs and it would be very difficult where you'd see people sometimes, it's like sometimes you want to almost faint, it was so long. But the thing there, they were all students of knowledge. So then it was uh, an environment for that. It wasn't really the old and the sick there, except for old and sick students. You know, some of the elderly that were there that lived in Damaj and stuff like this, but for the most part, everyone there was seeking knowledge and they were uh, accustomed to this kind of long, long, long tarawih going late into the night. So this is also in accordance with the madhab of the Salaf al and according to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi And Ben Othin mentions, he said, and this is the opposite of what a lot of people practice today. Some people pray tarawih with immense speed. So they do not have the mandatory calmness and serenity. They're not even calm. They're not serene. Which is a pillar of the prayer. Meaning it's a pillar of the prayer to be calm and serene in your prayer. Not to be a law like the law like the law like the just, you know, just so fast and cuss, prayer's over. You know? And so this is a very important admonishment for the women too, in that you pray at the home, that you also, you want to take time in your prayer. Don't be so quick. You have to, you get up for pleasure and you're tired, so you just pray... 30 seconds, your prayer is over, and you're already jumped back in the bed before you can hardly make to sleep. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi Jumping in the bed. So be careful. Try to be calm and pray with serenity, and that's for all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our shortcomings. Amin. Uh, the scholars, may Allah have mercy on them, say that it is makruh for the Imam to make the prayer exceedingly fast. So it's disliked. For the Imam to pray it so fast, but also part of the fit uh, for the Imam, and we have a precedence from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is that the Imam needs to know about his congregation. If there's a lot of old and elderly, uh, and there's a lot of elderly people, and there's a lot of sick people, and there are people, you know, people who can't stand for the prayer, people with young children, then he should be conscious of that and know and pray. And, and keep that in mind, and that's from fiqh fideen. Now, those are the kind of imams that are thinking about his congregation, and they're following the sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, because they're thinking about the people, and not just uh, just being uh, thinking about either praying long and being hard on the people. The imam ended this lesson, he said, by saying, it is not it's not fitting for men to leave this prayer and miss out on all the rewards, and they should not leave until the Imam finishes the prayer in the winter so that they may receive the reward of praying the entire night. So this is an admonishment for us as men that when we are praying Tarawih, that we should try to complete it with the Imam and meaning complete it even with the wicker. Uh, and then, then we get the reward as if we were standing the whole night as the Messenger of Allah, Salawatu Rabbi wa Salamu he mentioned. He said, it is permissible for women to attend the Tarawih prayers in the masjid if it won't cause any fitna. As the Prophet ﷺ said, do not prevent the slave women of Allah from coming to the masjid. This is from the actions of the pious predecessors as well, meaning the son of Asari, Ridwan Allahi alayhim, also used to allow the women to pray the, the prayer. And, and from amongst the Asari hat, they would pray the prayer. But it is obligatory that she must dress modestly observing proper hijab and not inappro being inappropriately dressed and not with perfume and not speaking loudly and not beautifying herself 
as Allah Taala says that they should not display their beauty and ornaments except what must appear thereof ordinarily. Um Ati said about when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered the women to come to the Eid prayer, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of us does not have jilbab. So he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, let one of her sisters give her one to wear. Mutafqun Alayhi. The sunnah for women is to arrive after the men and to be far from them and to start from the last line, for the last line is the opposite of the men. As the Prophet Wasallam said, the best of the lines for the men is the first, and the worst of the lines is the last. The best of the lines for the women are the last lines, and the worst are the first lines. And this is a Muslim. They should leave the masjid after the imam makes taslim, and they should not stay later except if they have an excuse to do so. Um Salama radiallahu ta'ala said, when the Prophet Wasallam used to make taslim, the women got up and left while the Prophet Wasallam remained shortly in his place before he got up. She said, this is, and Allah knows best, because the Prophet Wasallam wanted the women to leave before the men can catch up with him. And this is in Sahih Bukhari. Uh, and then the Imam ended by saying, O Allah, forgive us and our parents and the Muslims with your mercy and send peace and blessings upon the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and his family and his companions radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.